Before we start this episode, let's take the electronic components in the world's most basic circuit. First, we need a power source. This is a battery in this case. Then we have a load, a little light bulb. But aren't we forgetting something? Something important? Even the most basic electronic circuit has three components, but we usually forget about the third, conductors. In this episode, we will talk about this fundamental building block that connects components and guides electrons. Of course, the definition of electric current is the flow of charged particles, but it's electrons in our everyday use. Plasma and semiconductor holes are cool, but most of our conductors depend on free electrons. Metals and graphite have a lot of free electrons roaming around. They conduct electricity very well. Free electrons are available in conductors because the conducting electrons are naturally in the conduction energy band. Semiconductors tend to conduct, but they need an extra push to get those charge carrier particles, either as some energy like heat or doping, adding some foreign atoms like boron or phosphorus. And we have insulators. They usually refuse to conduct electricity, but don't let yourself be deceived. They also conduct electricity. Usually not much, practically zero in most cases. If air is considered a good insulator, then how do thunders happen? Breakdown voltage is the answer. If you have enough voltage, everything will conduct. So we have a lot of stuff with conductive properties. Even the earth and dirt, since we use ground conductivity for some transmission lines or the protective earth. But no one makes wires from actual dirt. Let's focus on what you can buy for your projects. Different wires, cables and PCB traces. We already talked way too much about conductivity, but this is the cornerstone of this topic. There are superconductors. They have practically zero electrical resistance if some conditions are met. But regular conductors limit the amount they want to work. And resistance says how stubborn they are. Every material has some resistance. This depends on the material, how long it is, the cross-section, and the temperature. To make our lives easier, we assume room temperature in most cases, resulting in this simplified formula. Keep in mind, resistance still depends on temperature. From the previous formula, the Greek letter rho is the electrical resistivity, is the material's property. This is relatively low for conductors like copper, and high but not infinite for insulators like glass. Remember, everything conducts some electricity. We are talking this much about resistance because it can cause a lot of problems. First of all, voltage drops when current flows in a conductor. Higher the current and or resistance, higher the voltage drop. For example, the voltage is higher near to a transformer and the grid operators have to take this into account. Also, voltage drop multiplied by the current means power and power means energy over time. Pure energy accumulating for no reason is not a thing because of physics, so the energy must convert to something and it will be mostly heat. This is of course highly unwanted and can be dangerous in most cases. So we are really waiting for those room temperature superconductors. One thing you should keep in mind in special cases. DC and AC resistance can be different. If you go AC, the moving electrons tend to concentrate on the outside of the conductor. Current density becomes significantly less in the inside with higher frequencies. A copper tube can have the same resistance as a solid rod at high frequencies. This effect is almost negligible with line voltages 50 or 60 Hz, and a few hundred amps are a lot. We will never need that much. But if you go radio frequency, even the thinnest regular signal trace can become oversized. Resistance has another implication. There is a limit for maximum current. The technical reason is every piece of wire is a low value resistor and the resistor restricts the current flow. There is another reason. Every wire has a practical current limit before it becomes a fire hazard. Governments all over the world created their own national electrical code and electricians must follow these rules. Some of them are more strict than others, but the physics is the same. The thicker conductor you use, the more amps is allowed. But back to the electrical codes. To help electricians, these rule books usually include some very detailed tables. These guides can give you a good starting point too. For example, if I had to power one of my projects that requires about 20 amps, I would choose 12 gauge wires for power. That's 3.3 square millimeters according to some tables, but the nearest one is 4 square millimeter in Europe, so I would go with that. However, these charts are only usable for wires and cables. If you plan to make some PCBs, 
you need something else. IPC, the Institute of Printed Circuits, has its own guide. This is like a 5D chess because everything is related. Also, you can't just download the IPC guide, so it's the best to use an online IPC calculator. If you need to root signals, you can use the default 10 minute trace suite, that's fine. But when you need to squeeze amps for power, you must do some calculations. Know how much amps you need, the accepted temperature rise, and what manufacturing process you use. Put them in a calculator and that's it. Use this trace suite for your application. I usually need only a few amps in my applications, so I pre-calculated some trace suites as a guide. The standard 10 mil traces perform surprisingly well. But we don't stop here. We have some other unwanted parameters, capacitance and inductance. And we can't avoid, just minimize them by smart design. Every piece of wire and trace has some inductance, just pretty low. It depends on the core material filling the inductor, usually air in case of most PCB traces, the number of turns, that's one for a single wire or trace, the area and the length of the coil. Also, if we put two conductors next to each other, congratulations, you just made a capacitor. The capacitance depends on the material or dielectric between the traces, the area and the distance between the conductors. These parasitic values are really minuscule, but not zero. Assuming common PCB manufacturing limits and choices, each millimeter of 10 mil with signal trace introduces 2 milliohms of resistance. Really not much, but not zero. Parasitic capacitance is much more fun to calculate because a capacitor is formed by two conductors. Two traces next to each other introduce about 1 femtofarad capacitance each millimeter they travel together. You can buy a capacitor with that low value, but a PCB trace usually has more than one trace next to it. It has another side, and most PCBs have one or more ground planes. The two sides form two capacitors, instantly doubling the value. Also, if you have multiple layers on a PCB, these layers are really near, these also form a capacitor. Getting the exact value of parasitic capacitance needs much more calculation than resistance. Luckily, it usually does not affect the average project's performance. Now, let's take a break from PCBs and focus on the different cable types you can buy. There are several cable types you can choose from. Different types of cables have different use cases, so let's compare them. Insulation protects the wire and the end user, but sometimes it's just missing. Insulation's primary goal is to prevent conductors to have a short circuit or someone to touch them. But what if the wire is really far away, like on a utility pole? Air is a really good insulator and the careful design can prevent accidents, so if you do see a power line within hand's reach, only common sense would prevent you from touching the energized metal, because overhead power lines rarely have a plastic insulating sleeve. Of course, underground power cables are insulated, still refrain from touching it, please. The other form of protection is just using low voltage, under 50 volt AC or 120 volt DC. It's considered low risk. So low, some lamps with telescopic arms use the exposed metal telescope as the conductor. Or cars, the ground is the metal frame. But wires and cables usually come with some extra protection. The most common is to have some kind of flexible yet durable plastic around the metal. It can have double insulation too, one for each separate core and one bundling them together. One other type is a thin coating on a wire. These enameled or magnet wires can be used in repair or making transformers, but most commonly found in headphones. One special use case is the solder mask. PCB traces usually can't contact each other, but an extra protective layer can prevent corrosion and help soldering. There are some exotic types of insulators too. Have you ever considered using paper? Some engineers do, because it's great in some cases. The main takeaway lesson is that insulation has two main parameters, its maximum voltage and the temperature. It can melt, catch fire or cause some other problems if these limits are exceeded. And the core types. There are two main types, solid and stranded. Solid wires have one solid core and stranded is made from several thinner wires bundled together like this wire rope in the middle picture. Both of them have their own use cases. Solid wires are cheaper and the same diameter can conduct more amps than stranded ones. However, stranded wires won't break if twisted or bent over and over again. One huge and often overlooked topic is the use of screw terminals. Solid core wires can be directly fastened in screw terminals, but the smaller stranded wires often loosen up over time. I learned it almost the hard way. 
I added a switch to my desk lamp and one day the cable just slipped out, exposing live 230V AC just next to a switch, where rules are required for stranded wires to prevent accidents like this. And we finally got to the clarification point. What's the difference between a wire and the cable? Everybody uses them interchangeably, but they are different. Something with a single conductor is a wire. It can be stranded too, that single core has only one purpose. If you have multiple conductors under a single jacket or sheet, that's a cable. It assumes that those separate conductors are insulated separately too. Depending on the application, a cable can have armor, reinforcement and shielding too. Another big question is, are we going to power things with our cable or just send signals? A power cable's main goal is to provide enough juice to keep devices running. Maybe on a long distance or hot environment, these are the main concerns. Choosing the incorrect cable can lead to a nice fire. Or using it the wrong way. Yes, you can use an extension cord incorrectly, just ask the welder who forgot to unwind his in a hot summer day. Or not plugging in a high power connector all the way, increased contact resistance can generate some serious heat. On the other hand, communication cables have low power signals with high frequency. We can pack a bunch of thin wires next to each other in theory, but electric noise, crosstalk and similar issues will arise. We often use special cables for communication, but regular ones are just fine in some cases. And of course, there are some mixed uses, like the power over the Ethernet or PoE, which powers the deck for device while data is transferred at the same time. And now we start to focus on communication. Simple wires are good for power, but we have to protect our signals. Single wires love to collect noise and it can downright destroy our communication efforts. Some smart guy came up with an idea. Let's twist wires in pairs and use them for transmitting signals. Twisted pair doesn't really improve power transmission, that's why we see them more in telecommunication. This invention is magnificent. Twisting wire pairs lower the influence of external noise. If an electromagnetic pulse finds a wire loop, voltage will be induced. The direction counts, so if the pulse hits a loop in our twisted pair and there is another loop next to it with the exact opposite orientation, the two induced voltages will cancel each other out. This is not the case with regular wires. This external noise immunity is already great, but if we combine it with a technique called differential signaling, it becomes a beast. Differential signaling is when we measure the difference between two points instead of referencing from ground. It needs twice the number of signal wires, sure. But if we subtract one signal voltage from another, we eliminate most of the noise picked up by the wires. This is used in professional audio gear too. This is called balanced. Instead of two wires signal and ground, we have three wires, a differential signal pair and the reference ground. Many decades ago, engineers thought that rising the signal voltages is the way to fight the noise over long distance. RS-232 used in old computer systems connected mainframes and terminals for example. The voltage of the signals went up to 15 volts, it still kept at a few kilobits per second. In comparison, the gigabit Ethernet can easily reach 100 meter and it only uses 2 volt signal stops. It's literally 100,000 times faster on much longer distances. That's the power of using differential signaling with twisted pairs. Last but not least, let's talk about electromagnetic emission too. Our signal cables do emit some EM noise too, because some current flows. With twisted pair, our own magnetic field dramatically shrinks because we switch the direction of our magnetic field vector with every twist and the field lines close in much smaller loops. With twisted pairs, we are more immune to external noise, emit less noise, no wonder we can bundle a lot of twisted pairs next to each other. But we still have some coupling. This is crosstalk, you can hear what's going on in other wires. This effect is reduced if you twist cables at a different rate. But sometimes we need some extra protection too. That's where shielding comes in. If you really want to block noise, you will have to have a shielded cable. Shielding is widely used to block external noise from coming in or minimizing emitted noise to be compliant with regulations, just like this ESP module in the middle. All the important parts are hidden under a metal shield. You can get UTP cables, the name is unshielded twisted pair. That's your regular cheap internet cable, which is totally fine, I use them in my home too, but there are better types. FTP cables are foiled twisted pairs, Packed each twisted pair in its own shielding metal foil, reducing crosstalk. 
SFTP or shielded and foiled twisted pair, the one in the left picture has a protective shield on the outside and foil for each pair of wires. Cost some extra, but necessary to use in some cases. Our last cable type will be the coaxial cable or coax for short. It's typically used in radio frequency, instrumentation and similar fields. It has a single conductor in the middle, an insulating dielectric around the core, one or more shield layers and finally an electric insulator. This was for today, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.